I do not care whether or not it is proper for a woman to give brave counsel to frightened men, but in moments of extreme danger, conscience is the only guide. Justinian, content with securing his eastern flank, was dreaming of glory in Africa. He should have been paying closer attention to the mood in the capital, however, because Constantinople was on the precipice. Tensions in the capital were reaching fever pitch. The populace were upset by rising taxes and increasing corruption. Games were to be held to celebrate the Ides of January and hopefully calm the situation. When Justinian took his usual seat in the Hippodrome, the situation started to turn ugly. The anonymity of the crowd gave someone the courage to taunt the emperor, saying that he wished Justinian's father had never been born, and the stadium shook with a roar of approval. When Justinian asked who was mad enough to address him so, the crowd exploded into a frenzy, bursting out of the Hippodrome, intent on tearing down the city. Justinian and his entourage fled to the Great Palace. His police managed to get the situation under control that day. He announced games to be held the next day in an attempt to defuse the situation. The next day, Justinian took his usual seat in the Hippodrome. The normal chatter of the crowd swelled to a deafening roar. The usual practice of the factions was to try to drown each other out by shouting Nika or Konka, followed by the name of the charioteer. The crowd turned this chant on the emperor, and Justinian had 30,000 people screaming the word in unison at him, unleashing their pent-up anger in a terrifying crescendo. At first, he tried to remain calm, but the sound became deafening, and the crowd threatened to sweep him off of his feet. He prudently turned and fled back into the imperial palace, locking the doors behind him. The crowd spilled out into the city, looking for any way to vent their frustrations. Finding the palace impregnable, they stormed the city prisons, swelling their numbers. Justinian sent out the police, but by now the situation was completely out of control. Senators and patricians joined the looters in the streets. The next day, the mob returned to the Hippodrome and demanded the dismissal of Tribonian and John the Cappadocian. Justinian, realizing that the Senate was working against him, relented. But this only emboldened them, and they would accept nothing less than his abdication. One senator roused the mob to go and besiege the imperial palace. The noise was overwhelming inside, where the emperor's advisors were in a panic. They still had access to the harbor, and most were shouting for the emperor to abandon the city while he still could. Justinian was about to order the ships prepared when Theodora, who held back while the men argued, rose and silenced them with the following words. I do not care whether or not it is proper for a woman to give brave counsel to frightened men, but in moments of extreme danger, conscience is the only guide. In my opinion, flight is not the right course, even if it should bring us to safety. It is impossible for a person, having been born into this world, not to die. But for one who has reigned, it is intolerable to be a fugitive. May I never be deprived of this purple robe, and may I never see the day when those who meet me do not call me empress. If you wish to save yourself, my lord, there is no difficulty. We are rich. Over there is the sea, and yonder are the ships. Yet reflect for a moment whether, when you have once escaped to a place of security, you would not gladly exchange such safety for death. As for me, I agree with the adage that the royal purple is the noblest shroud. With their backs stiffened, Justinian decided that if he wanted to save his crown, he had to go on the offensive. The imperial police had proven unreliable. However, he had other options. There was a large group of Scandinavian mercenaries in the city under the command of Mundus. Belisarius was also in the capital, preparing for his deployment to Africa. Taking command of the situation, Belisarius gathered a force and slipped out into the streets. Most of the rioters were still inside the Hippodrome, howling for Justinian. An elderly eunuch named Narses, who was commander of the Imperial Bodyguard, blocked the exits of the Hippodrome, while Belisarius and his men burst in, catching the rioters completely by surprise. The mob immediately attacked, but they proved no match for professional soldiers. Their angry shouts were replaced by the screams of dying men. When the killing stopped, 
the Hippodrome was drenched in blood, with the bodies of 30,000 Romans lying dead. The Nika revolt was over. Justinian was shaken by the riots, but he soon felt secure enough to reinstate Tribonian and John, but he did reel in their worst excesses. He didn't spare the Senate, though. Justinian had 19 senators executed, and those that escaped didn't fare any better. The emperor unleashed John the Cappadocian on them. The people of Constantinople learned a lesson. A wise emperor ruled for the benefit of the people, but this didn't mean that he sat on the throne by the grace of his subjects. Emperors could not be made and unmade on a whim. For three days, the smoke hung thickly over the devastated capital, with small fires still flickering. The rioters left a trail of destruction in their wake. The center of the city was a blackened shell, and the flames had claimed the city's cathedral, Hagia Sophia, as well as neighboring Hagia Irene. Surveying the damage of the city, Justinian saw not a disaster, but an opportunity. The destruction had cleared the detritus of the past, and now he could enact an ambitious new building program. This would transform the city and the empire into a glittering center of civilization. The citizens of the empire had never seen construction at such a pace. Hospitals and baths sprang up, fortifications were strengthened, bridges spanning mighty rivers were constructed. The most impressive work was saved for Constantinople, however, an incredible new Senate house, colonnaded with creamy white marble pillars and topped with fine carvings, rose near the city's central square to replace the ruined one. Three statues of barbarian kings were set up, all bowling before a large column surmounted with an equine statue of Justinian in full military dress. Constantinople gleamed with new construction, but this was all merely the prologue. He now began the project which would surpass them all. The old Hagia Sophia was undoubtedly the most important structure that had been destroyed in the riots. Originally built by Constantius II, however, this one was destroyed, and Theodosius II rebuilt it. Most people assumed the emperor would rebuild the cathedral in its familiar form. Justinian had different plans, however. This was an opportunity to remake the cathedral on a whole new scale, something worthy of his vision for the Roman Empire. A little more than a month after the riots, construction began on the new Hagia Sophia. He chose two architects who had more vision than experience, Isidore of Miletus and Anthemius of Tralles. His instructions were to create a building unlike anything else in the world. Sheer scale wasn't enough. The empire was full of grand monuments and immense sculptures. This had to be different, something fitting for the new golden age that was dawning. Expense was no issue, but speed was. He was already in his 50s, and he didn't want his successor to claim the building as his own. The riches of the empire were poured into its construction. Each day, gold arrived from Egypt, porphyry from Ephesus, powdered white marble from Greece, and precious stones from Syria and Africa. The building was growing at an unprecedented rate. In the end, it took only five years, ten months, and four days from laying the first stone to the completion of the building. A remarkable achievement in any age, much less one without modern machines. When Justinian stepped through the great doors reserved for the emperor and patriarch into the vast interior for the first time, he was overwhelmed. Marveling at the stunning panorama, Justinian stood silently, drinking it in. After a long moment, those closest heard him whisper, Solomon, I have surpassed you. We'll leave Justinian there for now, in a moment of triumph. In the next video, we'll see another dazzling campaign from Belisarius, this time in Africa.